This machine is a controversial piece of technology. Half of the people that you ask will tell you that it's overpriced and overhyped. Others will tell you that it is the gold standard when it comes to playing retro games. Normally, I wouldn't get involved, because frankly, I don't really care. But as you can see, I ended up with one, so let's talk about how in the hell that happened. And along the way, we'll see what makes it different from other handhelds on the market, and try to answer if it's really worth it. When the Retroid Pocket came out, I was the first person I knew who had one, and I brought it with me everywhere. I was happy to show it off to anyone who cared to listen. Then, one day, while I was waiting at the airport for my flight, a guy across from me kept looking at me and my Retroid in a weird looking but not looking kind of way, before he pulled out one of these. He may as well have pulled out a Crocodile Dundee knife and said, that's not a handheld, this is a handheld. I didn't know much about the analog pocket, except that it was reportedly impossible to get, and that fanboys doted on it with zeal that bordered on religious. Like all shiny things, if I was going to justify buying this new chunk of plastic, it would have to do something that my other devices couldn't, which is hard considering I already owned a Steam Deck at this point. I knew it could play original cartridges, but that doesn't really help me because I don't really own any and I don't need a new expensive hobby. But it's also FPGA. I don't know what that means, but I know the Steam Deck can't do it. Well, you know I wouldn't let myself off the hook that easily. If I was going to let myself buy this thing, I had to at least sort of understand what FPGA is and what makes it quote-unquote better than software emulation. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, and I have no education in computer science, but this whole channel started off with me making PowerPoint slides to explain difficult concepts as a way of making sure that I really understood them myself. So here's my best attempt at a crash course in Computer Science 101. To explain FPGA, First, let's see what's going on inside of a regular emulation-based device, and for that, we're going way down to the transistor level. Let's remember that all computing that is going on in your computer is literally just electricity getting turned on and off, like a switch. When the switch is off, the value is zero, and when the switch is on, the value is one. This is what allows us to count in binary, but to do arithmetic and logic, we need to be able to add and subtract these sums. This is where a transistor comes in. A transistor basically blocks the flow of electricity unless we add a small voltage to it. Then it bridges the flow of electricity. The way that we arrange these transistors is called a gate, the G in FPGA. Here's an example called an AND gate. If we turn on transistor 2 only, we see that the electricity gets blocked at transistor 1. Likewise, if we only turn on transistor 1, the electricity gets blocked at transistor 2. Only if we turn on both transistors do we get the output signal to be a 1. We'll call these transistors input X and input Y, and we can write the results in something called a truth table that looks like this. If either input is a 0, aka off, then the output is also zero. Only when x and y are one do we get a one. That's why this is called an AND gate. Let's try rearranging these a little bit. In this case, if both inputs are zero, aka off, then the electricity gets cut off, and the output is also zero. But if we turn input x on, we get a one in the output. Or, if we turn Y on, we get a 1. So this one is called an OR gate, as all we really need is a 1 in either the X or Y. There's also a type called a NOT gate, which simply flips a 1 into a 0 and vice versa. If we combine an AND gate with a NOT gate, we get a NAND gate. So if both inputs are 1, the result will be a 1, but it will get flipped, so it will be a zero. 
We can also combine a NOT gate with an OR gate to get a NOR gate. So if any of the inputs is a 1, the result will get flipped to become a 0. We can tweak these further by making them exclusive gates called an XOR or an XNOR gate, which means if either X or Y is a 1, the result is 1, but not if both are 1. By combining many different gates, we can create a gate array, the A of FPGA. Different combinations perform different functions. An array that adds and subtracts and processes binary come together to form an arithmetic logic unit, or an ALU. Arrays that can remember if they were given a 1 or a 0 become registers where instructions are stored and recalled. Arrays that direct where and when instructions are sent are called buses. When you combine these buses, registers, and logic units, you get a processor, like your graphics processor, your central processor, and your signal processors. Most computers and phones these days use standardized chipsets, but old machines like the Super Nintendo were made to play SNES games and nothing else. Likewise, the cartridge was meant to be read by a Super Nintendo and nothing else. To block their competitors, each console used its own unique set of logic and instructions. So when you play games on a software emulator, you're essentially running a virtual computer that takes the original instructions intended for custom hardware like your SNES and translates them into instructions that a modern computer can understand. It's sort of like connecting your CD player to a car that has only a tape deck. You need a fake machine to go inside and translate the signals back and forth. Software does a really good job of this, but it isn't perfect. Translating the instructions leads to latency, graphical errors, and other bugs. This is especially true for games that intentionally exploited flaws in the original hardware. The FP in FPGA stands for Field Programmable, which means that the electrical engineers can make each component be whatever they want it to be. You can think of it like a toy car made of Lego. It won't be as good as a die-cast car made in the factory, but you can customize it to be any kind of car that you want. For the purpose of retro gaming, it means that we can make the hardware be as close to the original hardware as possible. So the question remains, does FPGA really make a difference? Well, for me, the answer is no. I don't do speedruns or compete in fighting games where a split second of latency really makes any difference. And for the vast majority of retro gamers, I'd imagine that it won't matter for you either. But even if I don't find it necessarily quote-unquote better than software emulation, that doesn't mean that I regret buying it either. I'm glad I have this analog pocket for several reasons. 1. Aesthetics This thing is a joy to look at. It's an undeniably pretty machine, and it feels good in my hands too. The plastic is heavy and durable, and it feels like an actual Game Boy, much more than any of the cheaper handhelds out there. 2. The Playdate About a year before I bought this, I ordered a Panic Playdate. The same reasoning as the Analog Pocket. It does things that the Steam Deck can't. Now these things are also notoriously difficult to get, and as proof of that, I actually ordered these one year apart, and they arrived on the same day. But look at them. They look like brothers. Look at Analog Pocket just looking out for his little bro. Seeing these two highly designed machines side by side enhances the look of both of them. Reason number three, Wario. Recently, I decided to play through all the Wario Land games, and the pocket seemed like the best way to do it. This got me into this thing hard. All the games look and sound amazing on this, especially compared to the original unmodified hardware. It's rechargeable, backlit, and the screen is just so much bigger and more vivid. Speaking honestly, this thing mostly sits on my shelf for months at a time, but that's okay with me. Long ago, 
I realize that buying handhelds and playing handhelds are two different hobbies, and there's nothing wrong with that. If the object brings you joy, it's money well spent, even if you never play it. There will always be people trying to shame your hobby, no matter how you do it. Whether it's gatekeepers from within the community who tell you that you don't know enough about it, or normies who tell you that you spend too much time on your hobby. But hobbies and fandom are essentially how you choose to engage with something that you love, so nobody should be able to tell you that you're doing it right or wrong. If you're happy with it, then you're doing it right. On the debate of software versus hardware emulation, I probably fall on the software side, mostly because of the lower price point and accessibility, as well as many quality of life features that software emulation has developed over the years. Things like save states, fast forward, net play, retro achievements, rewind, hotkeys. If it hadn't been for things like save states and rewind, I would never have beaten a lot of these games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Ninja Gaiden. So what's the takeaway here? Well, if you happen to have physical games in your collection, then FPGA and the Analog Pocket is absolutely the best way for you to enjoy these, even better than original hardware. But if you're playing digital ROMs, even on a flash cart like this one, then the benefits of software emulation still outnumber FPGA by a lot. Having said all that though, if you're like me and you just like collecting these handhelds because they're cool and you enjoy the hobby, then this will be a beautiful addition to your collection. Overall, I'm glad that I have this little guy, and so is the playdate. Look at him over there with his big bro.